Welcome to the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast, where we explore the spirituality of the Christian child using the method of catechesis of the Good Shepherd. I am your host, Carrie Mecki Lozano. Today, I have invited a very dear friend of mine, Megan Hoffman, to join us on the podcast. And her and I are going to share a story with you of following the promptings of the Holy Spirit to build an atrium in Haiti. I hope you enjoy. Megan, welcome to the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. I am so excited to have you on the podcast. Megan, if you would tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got involved in Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. Of course, yes. Um, So I live in St. Louis, Missouri. I am a wife and a mom to a almost five-month-old baby boy. So Mm. I am sleep deprived morning, everyone knows. (laughs) Um, But I'm a former teacher. I now stay home with my son. But how I got involved with Catechesis of the Good Shepherd is through um, the mission work that I was doing in Haiti along with you, Carrie, starting a a school down in Haiti with the Revier Initiative um, and as part of that school having Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. So tell us a little bit about Revier. How did that get started and what is it? Yeah. Um, so the Revier Initiative, it is, our whole mission statement is to awaken wonder and joy in education in Haiti. Um, and how it gets started is after I did some short-term mission work in Haiti, I really felt through my prayers and the prayers of others, um, a prompting to um, open up a Catholic school in our, in our little town and to provide education, um, solid Catholic education for uh, local students and for the missionary children in the town and really just provide a space to, like I said, awaken wonder. Um, That was through Montessori education, through Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. We started off our first year five years ago. We had nine students um, and then it was myself and um, one assistant and one cook. Um, And now this year in our fifth year, we have 45 students. Um, We have nine local women on our staff, and we actually just started a professional school for parents and adults in the community. Um, So it has been a journey, definitely a uh, started off as a little mustard seed and um, has grown into a really beautiful ministry, which Catechesis of the Good Shepherd has played a big part in it. It's been really fun to watch Revier grow. It really did start off so small, but through your prayer and your following of the Holy Spirit, all these different little bitty things kept happening that were so neat. Remember when somebody donated money for for goats for each student oh, in yes. the house? Oh, yes. <laughs> each student in the class to have a goat? That was really neat. It just so many really, so many neat little things that have come out. And it's been neat to watch all the ripple effects that have happened that have come out from the school. And Revier, Megan, tell us, what does Revier mean in Haitian Creole? It means... Um, it's the word for awaken, yeah, which is our whole our whole prayer. So Megan moved to Haiti about a year after my family moved to Haiti, and you got there right before Hurricane Matthew, right? Yes, that's right. Actually, our first day of school was supposed to be the day of the hurricane, yeah. so we, we had to pivot. Yes, <laughs> you had set up the whole school. You had these beautiful Montessori women that came down to Haiti to help you set up the classroom. Yes. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, we had to box it all up as fast as we could because this huge hurricane was coming. I hope it didn't get damaged in the storm, and it was a wild ride. <laughs> yeah. It was a wild ride. That was crazy. That's for sure. That was a crazy week. That's for sure. But almost everything stayed intact, right? It really did. Yeah. Yeah. The Lord has been providing for this little school from the very beginning. And I mean, even with us setting up the atrium, I feel like, you know, we made the big list of everything we'd need. And you always thought it was possible. I was a little doubtful at the beginning that we'd be able to get it started, but... <laughs> Every time it came through. Well, one of my dreams whenever my family was moving to Haiti was I was hoping to be able to incorporate the work of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd into the mission work that we were doing in Haiti. So when you moved down there with this Montessori school right on the mission base where we were living, I was like, perfect. 
God was providing that opportunity in order to be able to bring catechesis of the Good Shepherd into that area. And you were so receptive. I was so grateful. You were like, sure. (laughs) Oh, I loved it. Oh, yeah. And I mean, could not have done it without you. You are my CGS guide in all things. You're so wise. Oh, you're so sweet. I would say you definitely pioneered just being able to get all the materials and translate. And I'm sure we'll talk more about it, but the, Mm -hmm. the beauty and the challenges of setting it up in a different country with different culture and different people. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was incredible. It was, it really was fun to watch God work. So you had your one room classroom Mm -hmm. that you had built. It, it was actually like at this old building. I don't know if you have before and after pictures, Megan, but that building was like in America, we would have knocked it down. It was so <laughs> dilapidated, falling yes, apart. for sure. <laughs> yeah, it was very much that way. But you brought new life into it. You had some of the local bosses come and th- were able to revitalize that middle room. Actually, wasn't it two rooms? Yeah, they ended up yeah knocking down a wall, um, adding a bathroom and plumbing and electricity and... Um, which after the hurricane, we didn't have plumbing or electricity mm-hmm. for quite a while, but, um, <laughs> yeah, they transformed the space, which so much of both Montessori and CGS is, you know, the environment and having a beautiful space and especially in a place like Haiti, just the importance of really having a well taken care of, you know, clean, the materials are, are ready for the students to work with was I think kind of a, a special little haven for the students. Yeah. And it always made me think about Sophia Cavaletti and how the atrium and the material are supposed to be simple and poor. Mm. And out of all the atria that I have seen, the one that we built in Haiti to me embodied that simple and poor spirit. And it's not because Haiti is simple and poor because Haiti is a beautiful country. Mm-hmm. But this atrium just had that essentiality of simple and poor all the way to its very nature, that it was just kind of embodying that very nature that Sophia was calling Mm. us to. And how with that, you know, poverty and simplicity, there's then such a a depth and and, and a door to the richness that the students can access. And, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we started out with just a corner in your classroom, remember? Yes. It was really small. Like, what would you say? Like five feet by five feet, maybe? Probably. I think we had maybe two bookshelves and then a prayer Mm -hmm. table. Um, And did we have a little altar? I'm trying to remember. We did. Yeah, it was neat. We had, Boss William actually did a lot of the woodwork. So he made, yeah, the altar and the prayer table Mm -hmm. and all of our shelves. And some of the materials we made, but a lot of them were donated from just so many different people in the catechesis community that you knew. That was another really neat aspect of building this atrium is being able to hire local people to build us different things that we need. So providing work for different people while we were trying to build the atrium. And I think I think they enjoyed it and thought it was almost so novel, uh-huh. like yeah. us showing them pictures of, oh, we want like a little altar. And, <laughs> you know, they were like, why? Okay. And <laughs> like, whatever you want, but I don't see what you're doing, but okay. <laughs> I remember our first few times doing lessons. You might remember this, Carrie. People would come and like peek in from the windows to watch the kids uh-huh. because it was just new and different. And I think in general, there's not a lot geared toward the child in terms of religious education in Haiti. Even, you know, here in America, mm-hmm. we might have like liturgy of the word during mass or things like that. But um, yeah, yeah, it was definitely a new, new experience. Yeah, having formal religious education for children, but especially because we were educating three, four, and Mm five-year-olds about the faith. Yeah, that was a huge novelty that you don't find very often in Haiti. And it was really neat to watch the adults watch us do this this kind of unique, crazy thing in their eyes. Um, But it, it was limited to just those students in your school that first year. What did you have, 10, 9? Yeah, we had nine students our first year, so it was just for those little nine. And I 
I can't remember how the conversation started, you and I, but it was like, this is amazing. We have this for these nine students. We wish more of the children in Haiti, you know, the ones that were coming to mass at the base with us or just right. the people we knew, their children, that they would have access to it also. There were all these children that would come to our mission base because we had this, it's it's really a basketball court, but we used it as a soccer court because soccer is more <laughs> popular in Haiti generally. So we had all these children that would come to our mission base daily, constantly, and they would be coming to just play and hang out. And we wanted so bad to be able to to share this work with all of these children, not just the nine that were coming to this school. Uh-huh. So we came up with this idea we called it um, taking it to the streets. Yes. Remember? Yeah, catechesis to the streets. Yeah, <laughs> I we started off. Remember with the Good Shepherd, where we literally carried the Good Shepherd material to somebody's yard. And in Haiti, houses are kind of clustered together, kind of like everybody in a family has a cluster of houses, all kind of like in a square or a semicircle around each other. And then there's this courtyard around in the middle called a laku. And we would take the Good Shepherd material. Uh Actually, we took some flat sheets. Remember, like a couple of flat sheets that we would lay on the ground. Because getting dirty in Haiti is not something that is culturally appropriate. And there's And yeah, there's a lot of dirt too. So we had to to find a solution. So we took some flat sheets and laid them all over the ground. And then one of us would sit in the middle with the material and, and start inviting children to come sit with us. And how many would you think... How many do you think would come and sit with us? You know, I actually was scrolling back at some old pictures from when we just started. And it would range from, I mean, I would say 20 yeah. plus sometimes. And we would kind of gear it. Yeah, we started with the Good Shepherd. But then mm-hmm. kind of depending on what time in the liturgical year it was, we would maybe do, mm-hmm. um, you know, the Last Supper or just something fitting for that that season. And I remember doing the visitation once and mm. um the pearl of great price yes that was another one yeah so you would be sitting on the sheet and then all of the children would come gather and sit with you and and then their older siblings would come and and the parents would walk out of the house and start carrying chairs out to sit and watch and yeah it turned into a huge crowd because the adults would definitely be coming they'd be interested in what we were doing so you'd have this multi-generational group of people surrounding us listening in to the presentation and we had translated the um Mm -hmm. the album pages into haitian creole with the help of a dear friend of ours and and we even translated some of the songs remember yeah some of the songs and all of our prayer cards would have you know, one side would be English and one side would be in Haitian Creole. Mm-hmm. And I remember translating, um, the Lord is my shepherd. Bon je se bon gado we, um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, we follow. Uh, he so we, walks I don't remember. <laughs> Lee mashi of him to you. Lee conin we, Lee remin we, Lee mashi of him to you. To you, to you. Yes. <laughs> and that one became pretty big. Remember, someone sent us a video of an orphanage or a group of children not near us of a whole bunch of children singing, singing the song. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and I feel like in ways even beyond what I know here in America and my atriums here is song is such a huge part of prayer in Haiti. Yes. So that was really fun to to teach new ones and to, yes. to translate the ones that we use in our work for it. Yeah. What I found really beautiful about whenever we did the taking it to the street presentations is that after we were done with the presentations, we would pass out paper mm-hmm. and crowns so that the children could have an opportunity for free art to, you know, have a response to the presentation that they just heard. And one, it was so neat to see these kids coloring all over the pages because so rare in their life when they would have like a blank piece of paper Mm -hmm. and crowns to be able to color whatever they want on. But what they drew reminded me so much of the children in America, of the children that I've worked with in other atria outside of Haiti. What they drew and the words that they chose to write 
it 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 was so similar to the children mm-hmm. of these same presentations these the essential message that they took out of these same presentations mm-hmm. and this universality of what was received this essential message of what was received it was so beautiful that it was universal absolutely which is how it was designed right i mean just mm-hmm. observing what the child encounters with the work and Mm -hmm. whether it's in America and Haiti and Italy, wherever it might be. Like the missionaries of charity who have adopted this work. And I'm sure they've experienced the same thing since they are international that they have seen that they see children all over the world have that same response, the same internal response to these core essential messages that are provided that the Holy spirit and the materials are guiding them to. And that was, that was a really beautiful aha moment for me to experience with this work in Haiti. And I, th- I think even with the same response, you especially Carrie did a really good job when we were building the atrium and preparing for whether it was working in the classroom or taking it to the streets, just the importance of making small changes to make it more culturally appropriate and relatable. Mm. Like we were really careful and aware of making sure, um, any yeah. pictures we used, the color of the skin of, you know, our, yeah. our figurines for the visitation matched the people who were using the materials. Um, or even for the altar, the baptism work, if there was anything different liturgically used in Haiti, we would try and have it look as closely to what was used at our, our parish there. That was so important. Well, when we were building the atrium, so what happened was Megan's classroom was in the middle of this building that had four side by side rooms and she was able to remodel the middle two rooms. And there was a storage room on the left and this choir room that was on the right that was being used already. Well, the storage room was full of a bunch of stuff that nobody (laughs) really used or looked at in the last 10 years. And we really had our eye on this room. Like, can we please have this room for an atrium? And (laughs) so finally we were, we were in there, we were looking at it, we were like, if we just reorganize this room, we could push everything to like and half of the room. Have half for an atrium. And then have half for an atrium and push everything to the other half and put up a wall and we could have half the room. And, and they agreed, they let us have half the room. So we did, we, we organized that room and It was so awful. I'm pretty sure there was like dead animals in there. Oh, absolutely. (laughs) Things had to be thrown out because it was ruined or whatever. And, and we did, we organized the whole room. We pushed everything to one half and we had the boss, boss Ruben built us a wall and they, and they re-cemented the walls and the floors where they needed and we painted it. And did we do windows? Did we, did we replace windows too? We did, and yeah, I think replaced the door. The door was, I don't think, was even on the hinges. So yeah, we got a brand new door that to help protect all the materials inside. And yeah, that was definitely part of our preparing the environment. It was, yes. it was different from most preparing the environments. <laughs> that was so fun, though. I think we, it's because we were just so excited to have like an official atrium space. It was so fun. And it was still was pretty small, Maybe like 10 by 15 max. Yeah, that's what I would guess. Yeah. It wasn't a huge atrium, but we were able to fit all the materials for a whole level one atrium in there. And like Megan said, we were trying to be very conscientious of what we put in there to reflect the Haitian culture. And in Haiti, many of the churches have beautiful pictures and statues that have been that have been passed down from either America, Canada or France from churches. So most of them are secondhand statues and pictures. And because they're coming from America, Canada and France, the majority of them are white, blue-eyed, blonde-haired Mary and Jesuses. And so because of that, the children in Haiti, many of them believe that Jesus was a white, blonde-haired, blue-eyed man. And some people even say that it's a white man's religion that they're participating in. And so we very much wanted to be aware of what we are putting in the atrium to reflect not only historical accuracy, but also the Haitian people that would be serving and working in this in this atrium. Mm, to help the children when they're working with the material to be able to relate to it yeah. and 
um, just hopefully help them pray, pray better. Yeah. And to be able to see themselves in the work and in the pictures and in the materials. Did we even have our, our good shepherd have dark skin? I know a I lot of the sheep so. were. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't remember about the sheep, but the good shepherd was a black good shepherd. He was not the typical white good shepherd mm-hmm. that you see when in when you see pictures of Catechese mm-hmm. Good Shepherd and such. And the same thing with the Last Supper pictures and the merchant and, and also the artwork that we were putting on the walls. We were very particular about what we chose. For example, we used Our Lady Perpetual Help, who is the patron of Haiti as well, and she also has darker skin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you found some really beautiful pictures for each of the infancy narratives. Yes. I I don't remember where we found those. I I don't think I found those. I think you found really? those. <laughs> or maybe somebody gave them to us. But they were very unique. I think those were the ones we put on the tracing mm-hmm, packet, mm-hmm. right? They were very unique pictures. They depicted the annunciation, the visitation and so on. But in in probably what could be described as like an African culture depiction, which is probably more accurate to what the Annunciation and Visitation, et cetera, looks like. It was like. actually like, yeah. Yeah. I had never seen these pictures before, so they were very beautiful. But what I found the most interesting about when we built this atrium, when we introduced the children to this atrium, and, and also the women that worked for you, they were shocked because mm-hmm. they had never seen a black Jesus before. They had never seen figures from the Bible that looked like them. And at first they didn't Mm. know who they were because they were so used to only seeing white, blue-eyed, blonde-haired Jesuses. That was really special. Yeah, that was really unique. Yeah, that was a big joy. But we definitely did not build that atrium on our own. No, so much help. And I feel like when when you were recruiting people to help donate or, or make some of the figures and materials for us, you would you would share with them our desire for it to look Haitian and to be able for the children to relate to it. And people really did exactly that. Yeah. They very much embodied that mission that we were on to make this atrium a truly Haitian atrium. And there was a whole group of women who in Georgia who sent us a few big boxes of stuff. I remember your mom Mm -hmm. bringing it to me when we were in Georgia. It was like Christmas opening mm-hmm. these really boxes yeah. and all these things for us to bring to Haiti to help us bring the atrium. <laughs> Christmas. And then we would have mission groups that would come for like a week long mission trip. And we would ask if anybody was interested in helping us and had different abilities. Remember there was a, a group from a boarding school in, in Boston mm-hmm. that, and mm-hmm. there was a few students from China and one of them was very gifted in drawing. Remember and and she drew a lot of our yes, tracing packets. Yeah, and was it maybe some of the geography material she helped us work on, or yeah, yeah. So we had different people who would come on these week long mission trips that helped us make these different materials. The relief map, I believe, was one, and the different prayer cards we had in Haitian Creole, and it was really neat to be building this atrium in Haiti with with Haitian Creole and black figures and such, but made by literally people from all over the world. All over the world. Yeah, it was beautiful. It was. It was really beautiful and unique. And I got so much out of us translating Mm -hmm. the materials. I think that really helped me. I actually became trained in level one Mm -hmm. CGS right before going to Haiti. So our Haitian atrium was my first really real atrium that I worked in besides just observing. Um, And it was really good for me to have to translate the materials and, um, or even, you know, translate our album pages and stick to that because it helped me avoid my natural temptation to want to explain or define or, you know, add to the text. And it, kind of freed me up to just wonder with the children and, you know, ask, ask the questions to help them wonder that I had prepared ahead of time and not, not add to it because I hadn't prepared any further translations. And <laughs> right. Right. So it helped us stay more essential uh-huh. because it's not like we were at a place in our ability to speak Haitian Creole to just uh-huh. speak off the cuff. Which now <laughs> working in atriums, 
here in America. That's with my personality. One of the things I have to work the hardest at is to just is to speak less <laughs> and observe more and and not interject. Let the child come to it themselves. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, that essentiality is definitely was required of us in Haiti because we literally weren't able to expand off of the album page because we didn't have the mm-hmm. language ability to do that. One it gift was a it huge gave gift to gift us. To me. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, Megan, what would you say is something that you learned or took away from this whole experience that we had mm. in Haiti and our work with Catechesis mm. Good Shepherd in Haiti? I mean, one lesson was just seeing how God provided for this atrium from, Mm. like you said, from someone randomly coming on a mission trip who had a skill for art that we needed at the time or people donating materials. Um, And then actually doing the work, I think I learned so much how to pray. I mean, seeing the children pray in the same way as the children we'd work with in atriums in America, but just really was impactful for me um getting to witness their simplicity of you know smiling at god at the end of a presentation or um their desire to sing or to say hallelujah and yeah i think something about experiencing that in a different culture and in such a really simple setting was was super powerful how about you carrie um I think in all the years that I've done catechesis, I've always been very struck how the work is is for children between the ages of 3 and 12, but it's so Mm. not limited to that. And you see this ripple effect that if you present it like you're presenting to a 3-year-old, but whoever is in the room is deeply Mm. impacted by this very simple presentation and I've always felt like maybe like if I were to present for to an adult especially one of those more simple presentations like maybe mingling of water and wine even though there is huge depth to that presentation it seems very simple or for the child or even the good shepherd when sometimes when you're presenting just to adults you might feel a little silly um But when you have children in front of you and maybe adults behind them, something different happens because Uh the adults know that you're presenting to the children at their level, but the the adults are Uh receiving as well. But they don't feel that childishness, I guess, if you were only presenting to the adults. And when we were in Haiti, where the majority of the people who would be watching the presentations or participating had very little formal catechesis at all, even though their spirituality tends to be much far beyond ours. For many people, the knowledge of our faith tends to be very simple. They'd be sitting alongside the children and just like in America, in no way did they feel um, not intimidated, but maybe offended by feeling like it was too childish. It was very much this universality, not only of all over the world, but the universality this work is for people of all ages Mm. has always been really beautiful for me to witness. And it was very obvious in Haiti. And what a lesson in like humility, you know, of an adult being able to receive it like a child would. Mm. I, I found just I have such distinct memories of observing some of the children in my classroom when they were setting up I don't know the prayer table or the altar and their slowness and intentionality and like their delight to just really carefully unfold the prayer cloth and lay it on the table Um, I feel like some of those moments impacted me so much of then okay I'm helping set up the altar before mass am I doing it with speed to try and get to my next thing or am I doing it with the same intentional slowness with the same love Mm -hmm. Um, mindfulness yeah there's something about I don't know us as adults pausing and you know when you see a child doing something slow I think it's so easy a natural tendency that we have to fight against to jump in and do it for them you know which the whole thing is 
help me do it myself. Right. And, um, and there, and that there is value in that simple moment of folding the cloth slowly. Mm-hmm. It's not just the end result of having a folded cloth. Mm-hmm. But the actual movements and the work of folding this cloth and those moments, and it has value there. And we have tr- totally lost that as adults, most of us. Mm-hmm. Like you said, we want the end result. Let me help you get there real fast kind of idea. Yeah, to grow in humility and patience and and just to see through the eyes of the child, their spiritual depth and richness. Is- yeah like you said, so good for us as adults to, to learn from and to get to mm-hmm. witness. Well, Megan, I want to thank you for sharing and helping me share this story of how God worked to build this atrium in Haiti. But I also want to thank you for one of the things that I've always been so impressed with you is your deep spiritual life that you have and how much you listen to God. And I watched that firsthand when we lived in Haiti together, but I, I've also watched it since then, and I really appreciate that and the witness that you have been to me as you've blossomed. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, As I was thinking through just the beautiful, beautiful um, journey of building that atrium and us getting to respond yes to that invitation from God to build it, and um, I was thinking of you and your passion and your zeal for missions and your your love of catechesis of the Good Shepherd and... um, Yeah, it wouldn't have happened without you. So it was such, such a gift to get to build it alongside you and really get to see it grow from a little thought and prayer into an atrium that impacted not only, you know, the first year, our nine students, but so many people in our little town. Merci, bonjour, merci. Merci, bonjour, merci. (laughs) Thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Thank you all for listening to this week's episode of the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast. If you would like to know more about Megan's work with the Revier Initiative, her website and the Revier Initiative Instagram account information is in our show notes. On that Instagram account, there are some pictures of Megan and I's work in Haiti, the atrium, and our taking it to the streets work that we did. Please don't forget that next episode, we will be beginning our two-part book study of Life in the Vine, The Joyful Journey Continues by Rebecca Reutsevich. So if you need a copy of that new book, a link to that will also be in the show notes. Next episode, we will be covering chapter one and chapter two with Rebecca. This podcast is sponsored by the United States Association of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. If you would like to know more about Catechesis of the Good Shepherd or to become a member, please go to cgsusa.org. Thank you all for listening this week. We will see you in two weeks. Go and fall more deeply in love with God.